Uh, good morning, everyone. If uh, you could all take your seats, we'll get started. Uh, I'm Dean Raymond Koo, and I'd like to welcome you all here today to the Law Review Symposium Government Speech, uh, the government's ability to compel and resp restrict speech. Uh, I'm the Associate Dean here for Academic Affairs, uh, and I'd like to say that uh, Dean Rawson, our Interim Dean, uh, sends his regrets for not being able to be here, but he is traveling doing the things that deans do these days. Uh, I'd also like to thank the symposium chairs here from our Law Review, uh, Jennifer Mesco, our editor-in-chief, and uh, Jennifer Ho Hoover Kappas, uh, our executive symposium editor, and Jonathan Etten, our Law Review advisor. Uh, also, two people who, without their help and uh, without their support, none of these events would ever happen, uh, Nancy Pratt Cantor and Alice Simon. Uh, I'm reminded of the timeliness of the importance of this topic, right, though I often point out to people that government speech and government speech issues have been uh, around and very much part of our First Amendment jurisprudence uh, before Sumum kind of re-raised re these issues. Uh, but on the drive in today, uh, there was a report about how NPR, uh, the National Public Radio, is being assailed in Congress uh, with the perspective of current uh, representatives saying that funding for NPR should be withdrawn, and then, of course, the idea that when the new Congress comes into power that there'll be a lot more support for withdrawing public funding from an entity such as NPR, uh, let alone the very first panel which we'll talk about today, which is the issue over funding and law clinics. Uh, now, in general, I know that the introductory speaker is usually one that just kind of does the nice welcome and there's no substance. Uh, the, I, I think I violated that rule the very first time I did one of these introductions and scared the panelists with actually some substance. Uh, but I, and I will continue that tradition. And I just want to leave uh, you with essentially two thoughts uh, as we consider the question of government speech, uh, both government as speaker and the government's ability to restrict speech through its role as speaker. And that is to be careful. Uh, often in our rhetoric, especially our public rhetoric, we talk about government as some separate entity, right? It is something out there. It is either something that will save us as in a form of a Superman or it's some enemy that we have to defeat as in Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky. Uh, but especially in our society uh, and especially in the US uh, under our constitutional form of government, government is not separate from the people, right? It's representatives, uh, while they maybe uh, will have and hold an office, say, of the President of the United States, uh, the individual holding that office comes from the population, comes from the community, and they are our representatives. And that makes this both co issue more complex uh, but all, and also provides a slightly different context for understanding what it really means when the government's speaking. Uh, so please don't fall into that simple trap of thinking that government is just some monolithic entity out there. Uh, the other, I would have to say, is to focus on the justification uh, that the government's offering for its ability to speak and control speech and use the purse strings to control speech. Uh, is it akin to the traditional concerns that we've been very skeptical of uh, from the First Amendment perspective, right? The prevention of criticism of government, the kind of idea that government has the right or the sovereign, especially the royal sovereign, had the right and ability to control any criticism, even truthful criticism of, of its behavior. Uh, or more rightfully, the idea that government can use its power to enforce some kind of orthodoxy, either political, uh, religious, or moral. Uh, is that what's going on? Right? Or is it really kind of as it's become very popular these days, just the simple aphorism that elections have consequences? And that is we either put new representatives in the bully pulpit uh, in which they are now entitled as a result of being successors and successful in the election process to use that pulpit as they see fit, or as we'll see, uh, especially in today's last panel, uh, to what extent can they create new pulpits uh, as a result of those elections? Right, so uh, join me in welcoming our many wonderful guest speakers here today. The Law Review has done a fantastic job of putting together a gr wonderful group of people that will help uh, us understand and hopefully engage in a more deeper discussion and discourse about the question of government speech. So thank you, welcome you for coming, and I look forward to a wonderful day of discussion.